Prince Street is brought to you by Dean and DeLuca, purveyors of the finest food since 1977. With over 40 stores around the world, Dean and DeLuca curates the best ingredients for life. I can't tell you who I was going with or where I was going. I've been sworn to secrecy. Meet me at the airport, he said. I'll have your ticket. When we finally reached the item we journeyed for, its flavor provided its own dramatic flourish. We savored it. We were amazed. Don't tell anybody we were ever here, he said. I told him I'd always keep his secrets. Secrets. Welcome to Prince Street. I'm Howie Kahn. This month on Prince Street, we're talking about secrets. Good ones, bad ones, and which in 2017 are impossible to keep. Some are hidden by history, like the uncredited African-American chefs who helped shape fine dining in this country. Others are at your fingertips. Missy Robbins of Brooklyn's Lilia Restaurant shares her pasta-making secrets with Eden Grinchman. Scarlett Johansson spills the beans, or the kernels, to Griffin Dunn on her latest business endeavor. And Alex Cornishelli talks with Giorgio De Luca about the secret litmus test that led to his success. Plus, I'll sit down with Wolfgang Puck to talk about Hollywood, his immigrant experience, and why he used to turn down the dining room lights. We've got a great show. Don't go away. My stepfather told me I was good for nothing. And then uh, uh, when I left the house, he said, oh, you're going to be back in uh, less than a month. And he was almost right. I was 14 years old and I worked for one month in a restaurant. That's Wolfgang. They, we ran out of mashed potatoes and potatoes in the restaurant. It was on a Sunday. It was very busy. And uh, so the chef called me over and says, you're fired. Go back home to your mother and everything. So then that night, I said, you know, before I go home, I'm going to jump into the river. I'm going to kill myself. Five decades later, Puck has his name on 103 restaurants in 11 countries. He cooks for the Oscars. He sells kitchen appliances of his own devising on TV. His first Los Angeles restaurant, Ma Maison, led to the opening of his most famous, Spago. 35 years later, it's still a hot reservation. Recently, Puck opened his first restaurant in New York City. It's called Cut. That's where we met up to talk. So Wolfgang Puck. Yeah, is that a bad name? Wolfgang Puck. I'm excited. Yeah. Welcome to Prince Street. Thanks Thank for being you. on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. So you're Austrian. Yeah. You moved here when? I left Austria when I was 17 years old. I moved to France. And when I came to the United States at 24, then came to uh, New York uh, first. I didn't like New York at that time. And then somebody offered me a job in Indianapolis. So I went to Indianapolis for a year, got my green card and everything there, and then moved to L.A. Immigration is such an important topic right now, so I'm, I think I'm really interested in the immigrant experience, and I'm wondering what your first year was, was like in America. Well, you know, it was such an amazing thing, because going to Indianapolis and then trying to get my uh, papers, my green card, it, that was one of the main things, because I remember I used to work, and I used to I bought a car, actually, after six months or eight months, I bought a used Cadillac. And then each time the police was behind me, because I was uh, basically an immigrant with no papers, I used to get so nervous. I said, oh, my God, here, they, here we're going to go. They're going to deport me. And uh, thank God Trump wasn't president then. If not, they would have maybe. What was required for a green card? Did you have to prove you had a, a, a skill that no other American possessed? Exactly. At that time, cooking in America was not a profession. That was way before the Food Network, before all that stuff. So cooks, if you were a cook or a used car salesman, it was basically the same thing. And I still remember one time when I went to L.A., I went to a club to have some disco with Nicky Lauda, who is an Austrian race car driver. And... I asked a girl to dance, we go and dance, and then she asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm a cook. She said, a cook? The song was over, she left the dance floor. <laughs> How did the community in Indianapolis receive you? At that time, I did not speak English, really a few words. I knew some kitchen English, that's what I said. Even if I would have gone out in the dining room, 
I wouldn't know what to talk to people. So my English was very poor at that time. So I was in the kitchen mainly. But the food, I cooked more steak well done in Indianapolis in one year than uh, in the rest of my life, I think. so. Was any of that frustrating for you as somebody who was trained in classical French cuisine? I said, well, I'm going to try to show them. And I tried to show them not to eat the steak well done. I remember often I cooked them like medium. I turned the lights down in the dining room a little bit more so that way they couldn't see it. But still, sometimes they saw a little pink, I think. And they sent the steak back. So and then I had to cook them well done. And it bugged me so much. I said, how can they eat the good meat well done? So that was one secret. You tried to trick the people of Indianapolis to totally, eat by turning rare the lights steak down. by turning the lights down. Yeah. I like that trick. That's, yeah. a, that's a good idea. So you moved to California in 1975. 75, yeah. Um, you're largely credited with inventing a new kind of cuisine for California. Right yeah. now, of course, Los Angeles is having this golden moment, right? Of, of yeah, but uh, California always had golden moments in a way because we have the ingredient. Like before I really started using local ingredients, a lot of people upscale restaurants thought they had to import things. After a while, I said, you know, we have to change it. We have to look at the cultures we have here. We have to look what's going on around us use the local ingredients because I grew up in a countryside on a farm. So for us, for me, farm to table was a normal thing. You know, we, we had our vegetables. When my mother made a vegetable soup, she went in the garden and said, okay, there's a cauliflower. I have some carrots or some potatoes, some leeks, and she made the soup. And then I started to use really all these ingredients and keep it really simple. Like I used the fish we had from there, like as a whole fish. People at that time didn't serve whole fish. But also, I looked around at all the different people we had. So we had a Korea town, little Tokyo, Chinatown, and so forth. So I said, you know, I think to me, that's really uh, what we should be too. We should represent the city. So I started to play around with putting raw tuna on the menu, a tuna sashimi. I uh, started to make a Chinese-style duck and spring rolls, whatever, but in my own style. Did people resist it in any way when you first started doing it? Were people open-minded to this kind of thing? You know, California is a little bit better, especially Los Angeles, because we don't have this tradition. Like here on the East Coast in New York, you have this tradition about French food, Italian food. It has to be a certain way. California, we are more open because we didn't have that tradition. There were not that many French restaurants or Italian restaurants and so forth. So... I think people at the beginning really were nervous. Like we had also a grilled tuna on the menu. And I served it with a tomato, basil, uh, mint vinaigrette, like in the summertime. So what I did, I cut a steak of tuna, maybe an inch thick or three quarters of an inch thick. And then seasoned it with salt, pepper, a little olive oil, and I only grilled it on one side. So often the tuna came back and people said it's not cooked. But so I tried to explain them. Tuna cooked well done is not good. You might as well open a canned tuna. Turn down the lights. Yeah, so I think, oh, my God, here we go again, like Indianapolis. And then when I opened Spargo in 1982, you know, everybody showed up. And one of the main people also, Billy Wilder, who is a fellow Austrian. So he, I remember after 10 days or so, two weeks we were open, he calls me up and says, I want to come to your restaurant. And I said, okay. And he said, like, 10 people. Okay. I said, okay. He comes in with 10 people, and he had, like, Kirk Douglas and uh, John Collins and Sidney Poitier with him. So it was, like, 10 people, 10 big stars. And all of a sudden, it was, everybody said, oh, my God, Spago is the place to go now. What was it like to cook for Orson Welles? Orson Welles was, uh, I became very friendly with him, and he was a great storyteller. And I used to sit for half an hour with him. I opened always a bottle of champagne. And Orson Welles likes it. I had to give it to him, but I liked it, really. Uh, right now, we live in this age of, of information sharing and social media, and everybody seems to know everything. But it wasn't that long ago when I think chefs cherished secrets in the in their recipes. Were there things that you did at any point that you would tell no one? I don't. I never thought so that there was a secret. I really believe, like, I remember when I did my apprenticeship in Austria, the pastry chef had a recipe book with the recipes for the cakes and everything. And he made me wait everything. And then he put one or two ingredients he put in. So we never knew the complete recipes. We know four out of six, but not number five and number six. We didn't know. So, and then one day, I knew where he kept his recipe book. 
So we lifted up the whole top of the table because it was locked with the key, the, the drawer, and took his recipe book, copied everything, and then put it back. So obviously it was gone for a day. He couldn't find it. He thought he left it at home or put it somewhere. He was totally crazy. But he found out somebody took it and they copied the recipe. And he called the police for stealing and they stole my recipes. And I was saying, oh, most of the recipes you could get in cookbooks probably anyway. So it wasn't anything that crazy. But he was so secretive. He did not want to pass along uh, knowledge. For me, it's the opposite. I think... I love to train young people, give them as much knowledge as possible, also give them the freedom so that way they can be inventive. How grueling was a kitchen apprenticeship when you were growing up? It was very difficult because I remember uh, it was uh, six days a week from 8 to 3 and from 5 to 10. A hard job, really, to do that. And it wasn't like cooking. I had to clean the stoves, clean the floors, and all that stuff. I heard you tell this story once when you gave your James Beard acceptance speech for your Lifetime Achievement Award um, about when you were young and, and the conditions being so abusive that you actually walked up to the end of a bridge. And yeah, yeah thought, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, when my stepfather told me I was good for nothing, and then uh, uh, when I left the house, he said, oh, you're going to be back in uh, less than a month. Well, I was 14 years old, and I worked for one month in the restaurant. The, we ran out of mashed potatoes and potatoes in the restaurant. It was on a Sunday. It was very busy. And uh, so the chef called me over and says, you're fired. You're good for nothing. Go back home to your mother and everything. And... Uh, I was like shocked. I said, well, you know, I didn't know how many potatoes they needed or whatever. Uh, so then that night, I said, you know, before I go home, I'm going to jump into the river. I'm going to kill myself. So then I was standing like for an hour on the river. I said, okay, I'm not going to jump. I can go back tomorrow morning and see what happened. Maybe he was drunk. Maybe he will forget. I went back to the restaurant way before the chef came. And then uh, the apprentice who was ahead of me put me down in the vegetable cellar. And I was peeling potatoes and onions until uh, one day the chef saw me down there and said, what are you doing here? I fired you. And I said, no, I'm not going home. I can't go home. He said, what do you mean? I said, he said, get out of here. I said, no. <laughs> and he was this big guy and I was this tiny kid. And then he called the owner of the hotel. And the owner of the hotel looked at me and said, okay. We're going to send him to the other hotel if he's that persistent. You know, he doesn't want to give up. Maybe something good will happen one day. Uh, you're 67. This is your first restaurant in New York. So I think it's really exciting to finally open in New York. Really full circle in your American journey. I mean, do you have any uh, culinary regrets over the years? Things you think you did wrong? Things you, you know, like a redo? I did a lot of things wrong. You know, only somebody who doesn't do anything, doesn't do anything wrong. You know, I do what I do best, which is restaurants. I love food and I love people. I don't go to work really. You know, it's like, to me, it's like having a party every night. Stick around for Wolfgang Puck's Madeline Moment. I started with that question first, the pivotal question. Is beauty subjective or objective? Because if it's subjective, then you couldn't say anything was beautiful and have any confidence in it. That's Giorgio De Luca. Forty years ago, he and two friends, Jack Sheglick, a fashion illustrator, and Joel Dean, a publishing executive, opened a food emporium in an ungentrified area of Manhattan called Soho. They named the store Dean and DeLuca. The store is still there, along with over 40 other locations around the world. As you probably know, Dean and DeLuca is our sponsor. After many years, the founders sold the store to pursue other interests. Joel Dean died in 2004. The store changed hands again, and last year its new owner invited Giorgio DeLuca and Jack Shaglick to come back to work. To help guide Dean and DeLuca's future, which includes a global expansion and small format stores by sharing the secrets of its past. Wait a minute, so you're saying beauty is not in the eye of the beholder? That's Chef Alex Guarnaschelli. Exactly so. It's not in the eye of the beholder. It exists independent of the eye of the beholder. Alex sat down with Giorgio De Luca to find out how this former school teacher and his friends Jack and Joel helped make America more delicious. 
I went to Dean and DeLuca when I was very young, um, and my mother, who um, will, you know, zip line across New York in a bikini to get a bottle of really good balsamic vinegar. And I think I watched her walk into the store, and she seemed to take a deep breath and exhale as if she had finally come home and didn't have to work so hard for what she was looking for. So when you walk into Dean and DeLuca and everything is, just feels like the best of what it is. Is that the idea? That's the idea. We wanted a store that reflected the world we wanted to live in, where we wanted to shop. That's what we wanted the store to be. My thinking was, you want to make them want to try it. They got to take it home. They got to taste it. They got to have it. Um, and you, you do it with seducing them through all the senses. The soundtrack, that's one thing. That sets a tone and a mood. Then you had the lighting had to be right. The visual merchandising had to be right. And then, you know, you order it up and you take it home. It has to live up to the promise. That's how you made a customer, not a sale. One thing I want to kind of marvel about for a minute is the way things were packaged and the way things were set up. Like the store was an experience, is an experience. Well, that's all part of the seduction. It was designed by Jack, who laid it out and meant it to be, you know, as much of a wow experience as you could have in a space. When I first met them, they were having a little get-together, so they invited me up for a drink. I was stunned the way they put things together. It just felt so right. It was one of the most beautiful and exciting apartments that I'd ever been in. Most of that was Jack. He was a fashion illustrator who was, who was moving towards becoming a painter. So we have music, Dean, then we have the visual arts, Jack. And you're the food? I was the food. I was the food guy. My father was a food broker. I have an Italian background, a strong food culture. And I brought that into the mix. I should have been the ambassand, you know, between Dean and Chaglick, I should have been the ambassand. But Jack said that he was the ambassand between Dean and DeLuca. Hmm. That was charming. <laughs> that I, was charming. You don't seem very ampersandy to me. But don't forget, they were sophisticated people. You're not sophisticated? Well, I wasn't then. I was barely sophisticated then, next to them. They didn't know each other. It was a cute story how they met through another friend. They double-dated these two women, and they looked at each other and decided, well, let's ditch the women. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was the start of that relationship. And every time Jack tells that story, I'm on the floor. I'm laughing. But... Can't say enough about Jack's interiors. So when we opened the store, Jack placed the things on the shelves. How did you know people were going to pay? Let's be honest, right? It's not exactly a discount store. We were talking to our, our immediate, immediate neighbors, the art community of Soho. Remember, it was an art community. Mm -hmm. I had a cheese store there for four years. And they were the top artists of the world coming to Soho. They were having cheese parties in their galleries when they someone had a new uh, opening of a show. You got invited to, you know, come by, have a glass of wine, and there was always cheese. I thought it was an obvious connection. Cheese and, and wine and, and artists. Is that where you got the idea? Probably. Early on. I did that when I was 23. I was going to some art galleries. It was so common. I mean, think about wine and cheese. They're, they're artisanal, nuanced. They're sophisticated products, the product of fermentation. But that's only the beginning. And then they have to be nurtured and cared for and aged. It's not like having a, a hamburger. A hamburger, just raw meat, slap it together, put a little seasoning on it, boom. This was a process. So what I did was kept adding things in the cheese store. Oh, let's get a little sherry wine vinegar. Oh, it's time for some um, good beers and some good French Brittany cider. Let's add that. So when Dean suggested that we combine forces and, you know, open our version of a small food emporium, I was ready for it. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking that it wouldn't work. Part of the reason was how much I believed in Dean. He was an extraordinary person, so intelligent. What, what I was it instantaneous? It, did you instantaneously know he was good? Was he a good bet? I had a great feeling about him. Did he believe well, in I, you in the same way? He did. 
He did. He, he had a lot of faith in me, trusted my instincts. But So that's the thing of substance that you left that experiential emporium with. So to me, growing up, that piece of Dean and DeLuca is not the ampersand. It's what's in the bag. And so if I don't like that lasting feeling at home, why would I go back no matter how you good it made me feel? Wouldn't. I would wander around you the store. You would feel cheated by, the pro by, by being seduced by something that didn't deliver. And we had to deliver. And that was your job? Well, that was primarily my job. We were turning people on to things. We were showing them things. We were, we were giving them an education about the possibilities of, of, of food and, and the pleasures of the table. It became a, a thing. People were lining up outside. We used to have to close the door on Saturday morning, let them in uh, three at a time, four at a time. We thought we were Studio 54 there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you were Studio 54 with a, a little yeah. Pecorino Romano instead yeah. of... Instead of uh, disco balls? Yeah. So this um, this artist community that you were sort of immersed in... Next Donald to the, Judd was a big fan of my cheese store. I imagine you had some illustrious artist customers. Of course. Plenty of them. So Basquiat, for example? Well, Basquiat, you know, I spoke to him a little bit. I picked out some cheese. He'd love to buy big cans of caviar. Hmm. The original tins. And take out a pile of cash. <laughs> he was enjoying his newfound wealth. He was he was gonna live it. He was gonna live it. Artists, say artists. So you, you they spend their money on 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 food and wine and quality things, and they couldn't afford a, a, a new new coat, but they could buy that piece of cheese, and they'd be glad to do it. So I uh, became friendly with Basquiat, and um, just enough to chat and whatnot. And um, one day he, he had two or three bags, and I said, well, let me help you. And I thought it was just going to walk, you know, across the street to a car or down the block. But we walked over to the, I think it was the Bowery. He was living on, a bow, on the Bowery somewhere. But in a nice loft, or just off the Bowery somewhere. And then he'd come in the store, and he would be very upset. He told me about having a, a meeting with his father. And uh, it was very troubling. He didn't, he felt his father didn't understand him. And um, didn't didn't appreciate him, basically. And um, who doesn't feel that way in some form or yeah, another? Yeah, exactly. But he was still in that phase where he was wrestling with that. You know. Do you think a piece of cheese was part of the way to a better place for him? I think uh, the caviar was for sure. Medicating. Medicating, sure. I think a good scoop of caviar in your mouth when <laughs> there's some music playing is yeah. medication for anybody. Yeah. Well, some people don't get caviar yet, you know. Oh, that texture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's sexy. I remember I many, many tastes that I had for the first time were from them, were from Dean and DeLuca. Yeah. Well, we had and to I do became that. a chef. Yeah. You do you realize the lasting impact? We, we inspired you to become a chef. Is what you're Definitely. saying. Definitely. That's yeah. right. So, are you inclined right now, say, to go through the store and pick through a few things and sort of take a take its temperature and see if it still has those tastes and those feelings that you want it to have? Well, I still enjoy going to Dean and Toluca. I feel it's um, lost its way for a while, a little bit, and it was drifting. And um, current ownership is reversing that, and I'm engaged in helping them. And so I am excited to be doing that with them, sharing my past experience and what. Uh, what I think they should be doing with them almost on a daily basis now. So I'm enjoying it, and I still enjoy the store. I still enjoy, I always like food stores. That, that's an adult playground as far as I can tell. Well, it's been great talking to you for me. I think there's been some sort of coming together of many things that I grew up with, um, and I, I know when people listen to us, they're going to they're gonna get some of that feeling. It's going to be like eating a really good wedge of cheese. Good ravioli. Good ravioli. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. It's really been a pleasure. I enjoy talking to you. I, 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 I mean that sincerely. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's time to try something new with Eden Grinchpan. This month, Eden visits Chef Missy Robbins at her Brooklyn restaurant, Lilia. Situated in a former auto body shop with high ceilings and huge windows, its pastas have earned the restaurant a devoted following. 
but good pasta isn't exactly easy. Luckily, Missy divulges some of her most important secrets. Next. This was never meant to be a pasta restaurant, which it has turned into. Pasta has always been my first love. If I could do one thing all day, it would be sit in the back room and, and roll out pasta all day. But it wasn't developed as a pasta restaurant. What it was developed as is this place where people could come and there was variety. And I really wanted to cook food that people craved. So I concentrated on the things that I crave and what do I want to eat and hoped that people would relate to it. And the, I think the biggest change in the food between Avoce and here is I'm just cooking food that I hope people want to eat. Really, I just wanted to create a restaurant that I wanted to go to every day. The other facet of it is that during this time off, I changed my diet dramatically. I went on Weight Watchers and I lost uh, about 40 pounds. So I changed my diet a lot and I got really into vegetables and really into fish and I was also really inspired. So there are seven sections on the menu, I think. They're all kind of inspired by different things. The fish is inspired by the wood grill. The cocktail snack section um, comes from my times in Milan and Venice and hanging out eating cicchetti and going to Milan for a pair of TV hour and having an Aperol spritz and them delivering awesome little snacks and the antipasti section is almost all vegetables at any given time and that's your been, artichokes thank oh, you my God. thank you but so, that's like inspired by you know that dish is inspired by sort of the best version of your grandmother's artichoke and so many people I think the cool thing about this food is everyone says, oh, that's like my mother's, or that's like my grandmother's, but it's better, or whatever. The rigatoni, um, I want to eat red sauce every day. And you and I are going to make gnocchi with red sauce yes. later. But like, that's what I want to eat every day. Mm -hmm. I don't eat it every day, but that's what I like crave. And the idea is to keep them really simple and really flavorful and focus on the texture and make sure that again, that people are like, wow, what's in that? People can't figure out why the Malfadini's good. And I kind of put it on the menu as a joke to myself to see if people would like it. I, I, I honestly never thought that it would take on this thing. While I get the association to Cacio Pepe, it mm -hmm. really has none of the ingredients that Cacio Pepe has. It has butter and parm. Cacio Pepe has pecorino. And to me, it's like grown up buttered pasta like mm. that you eat when you're a kid and that's what I love if I I mean I would eat that every day butter cheese and pasta it's but it amazing. has that sophistication of and the, the pink peppercorns mm -hmm. gives it this kind of cool like what is that and people think that we're doing something crazy but there are really three ingredients in it you know some of them are more complex I think the Agnolotti with sheep's milk oh, um, cheese is is definitely the most sophisticated sort of dish, and I think more with the like honey my and saffron. Don't even. I think it's cool because it surprises people, and people have never. People are like, "What chilies and saffron and honey and oh. sheep's milk cheese?" And there's feta in there, and that combination of honey, saffron, chilies it's just was perfect. something I read about. It oh, was a perfect. combo that I read about, not necessarily for a pasta. And I was like, "That's in an Italian, like an old school Italian book." Um, this is the first time I've done extruded pasta. Actually, I have always done handmade only. Our extruded is not 100% dried, so we dry it a very specific amount of time, where it has this kind of in between dried and fresh feel to it um and and it's an art when we first opened we opened in january there was no humidity it was cold our pasta dried in two hours exactly to where we wanted it every single day on a rolling rack in our pasta room cut to spring and summer we could not get it dried right for the life of us and it was inconsistent every day and we had to play around with it a lot i mean our pasta guys come to one of the chefs every day and say is this okay is this done right so it starts with i mean it starts with the right proportions of water and semolina and mixing it properly and making sure it's coming out of the extruder properly it then goes to the drying process it then goes to the cooking process um and you really have to rely on your cooks to to nail it and there's a really fine line between how much you cook it in the water and how much you cook it in the pan to finish it and absorb sauce. So is that something that you find that a lot of your chefs already know, or is it something? No, you no, need no, to no. Know? They you... don't know it at all. No. That is, that, I mean, unless they've cooked, unless they've cooked in Italian restaurants before and they've done pasta, but it's something that they learn and you have to teach. So not only 
do we finish stuff in sauces, but we also use the salted po starchy pasta water. I was going to say, this, it's, I feel like that is honestly like the secret. That is the, the secret. To the, you know, it the is beautiful the secret. sauce is you that know, pasta water. I didn't know. I mean, I learned when I went to Italy, and then I learned more from Tony when I worked at Spiaggio, but I didn't, I didn't know. It's not something people know. And it's also a really hard, again, balancing act, because if you put too much in, your pasta becomes too salty. If you put it in way before your pasta is absorbed, the rest of the sauce, you are going to have very salty, reduced salty tasting pasta. I used to always stand over pasta uh, pots as well with a bottle of olive oil. This is how I was taught. You finish every pasta with olive oil and you toss it and toss it and toss it. And when I cut out the fat from my own diet, I stopped doing that here. And what I realized when I cut out the fat in my own diet it wasn't really making that big a difference. And so I've changed a lot of those techniques too. And that's been a learning curve for anyone who worked with me before. You can also come here and not eat pasta. I mean, you can okay, come. Don't say that. Well, Missy. you can though. Don't, don't say that. You can't come here without pasta, okay? I'm putting okay, that you out can, there. Can, okay, you, you cannot. You have to, at least Oh, one. I ask people. If they don't order pasta, I go to the table and ask them if everything's okay. What's next for you? Well, I'm working on a cookbook that's almost finished that'll come out in September of 2017. And that's about changing my life and all that. So that's kind of a big project. Well, Missy, thank you so much thank for you. sitting this down with me. Fun. This was amazing. And I cannot wait to get in the kitchen Let's with you. Do I'm doing something off the menu for you. You want to know the secret? To see Missy Robbins and I cook her ricotta gnocchi, head to livefromprincestreet.com. And now it's time for Love Your Work with Griffin Dunn. Hi, this is Griffin Dunn from Love Your Work. Now, next week, I wrap this series I acted in for Amazon called I Love Dick. And it's a custom of mine at the end of every shoot to buy the crew a little something special. You know, a coffee cup with my name next to a peace sign. Just something that makes them both remember me fondly and wash away any unpleasant memories about my behavior. I saw that Scarlett Johansson has this popcorn store in Paris called Yummy Pop, and I got this amazing idea. Bags of boutique popcorn for people in show business made by a movie store. Movies and popcorn, get it? I know, genius, I know. So I called Yummy Pop in Paris to see if they could help me. Hello. Oh, hi. Is this is this Yummy Pop? Yes, this is Yummy oh. Pop Paris. Oh God. Okay, listen. I, you speak English? Yes, I speak English. <laughs> yeah, of course. You could understand me. Of course, you could. Hi, I'm mm -hmm. um, I'm Griffin uh, Dunn. I'm calling from uh, uh, Hollywood, California. Um, mm -hmm. And I I hear that this is a, a Yummy Pop, and I'm, I've got to get a bunch of crew gifts. I know exactly and what you mean. Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah. So, um, I hear Scarlett Johansson. Um, it's like her store. Is that right? Well, yes, yeah, actually, uh, this, this is Scarlett speaking uh, right, right, right now, Griffin. This is me. This is me speaking. Oh, my God. Did I just... The very, the very one. <laughs> you, you answer your own phone in Yummy Pop? Well, we're a startup. You know, we're a small shop. So, we're, you know, we're, we, we... We were we were a mom and pop pop oh, shop. Wow, but I hear it's so good. Um, uh, you know, I'm I mean I'm partial to pop. You know I'm a pop. I'm a bit of a popcorn connoisseur. How did that happen? I love popcorn. I like snacking. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I you know I I I'm from New York of course so I um I think that I'm you know a bit of an everything kind of connoisseur. Yeah, I'm yeah. From New York. You know how we are, and so uh, you know, I, I I basically, you know, I've 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 always loved popcorn, and I've I've always dreamed of opening some kind of food shop, and um, you know, whenever I was in Paris, I could never get popcorn except for at the movie theater, um, which was just, you know, if I saw I saw a hole there, I just I basically opened a popcorn shop because I really just wanted to get popcorn in Paris, which is where I that's, live. That's so. Selfish and giving at the same time. <laughs> I was speaking with Woody Allen recently, and he thought that there was a surreal element uh, to me selling popcorn. Um, but 
uh, you know, it's, it, I guess it's kind of unexpected, but not to those who know and love me. I would I'd love to be in that club. And and how did you know to tell them how to make it so it tastes good? I mean, did you make it before? Well, I make popcorn at home, and uh, I was trying to figure out, you know, how to, uh, you know, what, I mean, popcorn is such a, it's really like uh, Parisians associate popcorn with going to the movies, and it's just kind of that, you know, mm-hmm. it's sort of like already in a bag, and that's just the way that they eat it, and it's not, I think, uh, uh, the French in general are not really like a snacking culture. Um, it was a little bit of a, it's a new concept uh, for the French to wrap their head around. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of, in in Paris particularly, there's a lot of American food stores opening, mm-hmm, burger mm-hmm. places and bagel places. And, uh, you know, there's this kind of new movement towards like, accepting American snack food. And so um, I worked very closely with my good friend and chef, uh, Will Horowitz. He also shares my love for popcorn. <laughs> um, so we, we created all the flavors, and then we figured out, you know, kind of how to make it happen in Paris. And it, it actually, we pop fresh in the store mm-hmm. every day. It must smell um, really good every day. Yeah, it does. It's like, uh, it's just, it's like a, an explosive experience going into the store. Um, and uh, it's, it's, the store's got a great look. It's in the Marais, which is a really like jumping area. And, uh, and the pop, the product's just delicious. What can I say? Yeah. I used to work at Radio City Music Hall um, as a um, popcorn concessionaire. And it was one of my first jobs. And during the holiday season, they have the camels for the nativity scene. Mm. And and they keep them down below, uh, you know, like four flights below in, in Rockefeller Center. And they love popcorn. And I used to bring these, I had to carry these huge bags of popcorn. And I'd always stop by the camels. And they would go, they just loved them. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, I grew up, like, making popcorn to watch movies on TV and stuff like that. I mean, it's mm-hmm. kind of part of, like... Yeah, and I know, it's sort of like a family exactly. snack food, I guess. Yeah. Not, we don't just associate it with like going to the theater. Um, mm-hmm. And I think also because, again, I don't think I think snacking is kind of a new concept. Um, you know, for instance, like my daughter loves popcorn; she eats it all the mm-hmm. time. But my husband, like growing up, his parents would never let him eat popcorn in the middle of the day because it was just <laughs> not part of a meal. Um, so it's, yeah, I think it's just it's just a you know it's an it's an, like I said it's kind of a new a new idea. You're changing uh, you're changing the culture. Uh, let me pitch you. <laughs> I'm adding to you. it. You're adding <laughs> to it exactly. I'm really excited about this. This is a brilliant idea. Um, listen, I'm not that you're not important or anything, but I'd rather have my assistant do the details with you. Oh oh, oh okay okay no okay. problem. Okay. Uh, so you know, all right. it's just I'm wanted on set. Um, oh, all right, all right. Her name is Jasmine. Uh, okay. Bye, Scarlett. Thanks for your call. Jasmine! Jasmine, will you will you deal with Scarlett? Line one? Thank you. And finally, Julia Bainbridge has a story about a chef who is dedicated to revealing an important 200-year-old American secret. I uh, was in London, and I woke up in a cold sweat. That was Chef Ashbel McElveen, an African-American chef born in South Carolina in 1950. After working in kitchens in Paris and London, Ashbel opened his own restaurant in London, which the late A.A. Gill gave four stars. And all I hear very loudly, how could you have forgotten me? And I really think it was James Hemings. James Hemings, who is he? James Hemings was the enslaved ballet that Thomas Jefferson took to Paris with him for the express purpose of learning how to be a French chef. We've all heard about what a gourmand Thomas Jefferson was. Now, thanks to people like Ashbel McElveen, we're finally learning about one of America's culinary secrets, the slaves, who not only did the cooking, but created the recipes, too. We're downtown in New York City in a tiny park. It's called City Hall Park. And why are we sitting here exactly? 
Well, we're kind of retracing James's steps in making a monumental dinner in June of 1790. These were all farms, literally, apart from the church there. Right in the distance is the municipal office building, and it was the first ice house in America. And that's where he got the ice to make his famous dessert, like baked Alaska, which is ice cream wrapped in meringue, which doesn't conduct heat. That's why he was able to make that famous dessert to get to the ice house. James had to walk past the Wall Street slave market. Okay, so this was a dessert he made at what's called the Reconciliation Dinner. Yes. Tell us more about why that dinner has become so historic. So it was a colonial back office dinner. Mm -hmm. And why it's so important in American history is that the biggest problem facing the colonial government was the debt from the colonial war. Jefferson yeah. had these kind of power dinners. And James was the person cooking his power dinners. Is it safe to say that the reconciliation dinner, or the reconciliation perhaps, was made over ice cream? <laughs> Absolutely. It's very safe to say because the whole dinner put them in a mood to compromise. What but might he have served at that dinner otherwise, do you know? He served um, capon stuffed with Virginia ham. It was a style of cooking that James uh, created in Paris. It was half French and half Virginian. So it was really kind of the first French fusion cooking was mm. James's take on French and Southern. The reason why he's not more known and celebrated is that he's under the myth of Thomas Jefferson, the great gourmet. Mm -hmm. And I bought into that myth myself. I drank that Kool-Aid and uh, made a dinner at the James Beard House in 1995 in tribute to Thomas Jefferson. And I didn't know really anything specific about James at the time. What made you want to find out? How did you get interested in this? I come from a long line of cooks. And um, I was on a train going to Paris. Well, I was reading Alice's Wind and Gone. About soul food and about yes. black cooking yes. in America. Yeah. Yes. And this light bulb went off in my head, and I was like, whoa, James Hemmings, that was his name. And I was just furiously looking on my phone for info of James Hemmings, and he was the person that I didn't know about. And so when the train arrived in Paris, I literally tucked that book under my arm and went around walking places that I knew that he would have walked when he was in Paris. And that was a real revelation to me. And that was when I seriously started to know that I wanted to write about James Hemmings. Yeah. How did this then turn into your creating a foundation in his name? I mean, what hooked you? Well, I, I did get a visitation from James, which, I, which was a very spiritual thing. And, um, and I, I, Wait, I, don't skip over that. What happened? No. <laughs> <laughs> I did get a visitation. I was awakened in the middle of the night. I, I was in London. And all I hear are a berating of the worst character flaws that I have thrown in my face over and over again, very loudly. How could you have forgotten me? How could you have remembered all of this shit? And excuse my French. And how could you have got forgotten me? And I realized that it was, as a Southerner, I believe in Hans, a benevolent, a Hans is a benevolent ghost. Okay. You're not happy. Okay. <laughs> and that was a visitation. I knew it was a visitation from my aunt, and I really think it was James Hemings. What was all that other stuff? And what well, did he represent? It was doing the dinner for Jefferson uh. at the Beard House. And that was, how could you remember all of that and, right. not, and forget me? And I immediately knew that it was something egregious, uh, akin to burning the barbecue sauce, which I did once and nearly got drummed out of the family. <laughs> <laughs> so did you, you wake up from this dream, fever dream, and decide... <laughs> and the whole plan for the Hemings Foundation was formed? I mean, what were yeah. the steps towards this? Well, um... It was the time that uh, controversy around um, Paula Deen. Mm. 
I grew up with the same thought that she had, and it was, if you were going to eat fine food, the best food, a black person had to make it, and a black hand had to serve it to you. That was fine dining. And so I understood, as a southerner, what she was saying, apart from the N-word, I understood because I grew up in that same atmosphere is like if you want the best food it's in a private home that has a black cook mm -hmm. and a butler and yet these black cooks aren't recognized uh, absolutely and i realized that i needed to be back in this country to add my voice to um what needed to happen a lot of the things that were omitted from american culinary history was it hard to find information digging there around was, there looking was for cursory information but all enslaved people most of them didn't know how to read and write or it was illegal it was definitely illegal in virginia for a slave to know how to write but jefferson's family was very more complicated much more, <laughs> much more complicated yeah. so the first written recipe for vanilla ice cream happens to appear in when? 1790, after James made it for this famous dinner. Mm. And the recipe's author is Thomas Jefferson. And there are lines scratched out. And I, I looked at it, and they were putting in Cook's nuances. So I said, how can some man who's never cooked anything, there was any, never any record of him going into any kitchen, is like, how can this man know a cook's nuance? What yeah. are some other examples of your recipes of quote-unquote Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we make sauces and, and gravies with the French style, hmm. doing a little butter root instead of, instead of what the New Orleans root has become, which is oil and flour. Right. Um, and potatoes were something that people didn't eat at the time because it's a nightshade, so people thought it was poisonous. So out of that kitchen came French fries, all kinds of recipes for potato. So would you say Hemings is responsible for French fries? He learned how to make French fries and macaroni and cheese in Europe and made them both for Jefferson in Paris. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So. <laughs> and then came back and continued to cook for Jefferson. Yes. When Jefferson was elected president in 1801, he sent for James to come to the White House to be the chef. But James, who was cooking at a tavern in Baltimore at the time, refused unless Jefferson wrote him a letter, as he would any free man and Jefferson refused to write him a letter. And James never became the chef at the White House because of that. So I was going to ask, considering the family ties, was it a friendly relationship? But it sounds like not. Well, the, Jefferson, he didn't like confrontation. Mm. And this was definitely somebody saying no. So he literally wrote a white French chef instead. Huh. Then James got the last word because he's... His pupils went to the White right. House. Right, yeah. <laughs> Two key women, Franny Hearn and Elizabeth Fawcett, were cousins of James Hemings, and Jefferson took them to the White House to teach the French chef that he hired instead mm. of James to cook James's signature style of half Virginian, half French. I see. And I know that the foundation does more beyond just... Um, awareness. Right. Of. We're endeavoring to put up a digital archive of African American family recipes. And we're looking to support chefs going abroad so that the, the cuisine expands. And a lot of times, there are not very many opportunities for African American uh, chefs to travel. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping to be in a position to make sure that some of that happens. Yeah. I guess the last question, Ash Bell, is, you know, we know why it's important for this information to be acknowledged, um, but for you personally, why are you on this crusade? Well, I, I just think that I'm very blessed to be a part of this 
legacy that, that's being built, a legacy of an American hero. And that is so rewarding. So that now that we're able to get beyond consumers like Jefferson and to the people that actually prepared the meals. Well, it's getting louder out here in City Hall Park. I think people mm -hmm. are getting off work. Mm -hmm. And I want ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. In 1801, James Hemings committed suicide. Ashbel McElveen is currently at work on a novel about his life. To learn more about this story and the James Hemings Foundation, go to our website, livefromprintstreet.com. And now it's time for our Madeline moment. I'm Wolfgang Puck, and this is my Madeline moment. I go skiing, and after ski, I'm hungry. I have a ham sandwich with horseradish and a beer. I close my eyes, and I said, I'm in Austria. We had a little house in a place called Unterpergen, which means under the wood or below the forest. The mountains where I grew up in Austria were not really the high mountains. I would say like 3,000 feet high, from three to 5,000. But below the forest, there was a terrain uh, there where they had the cows and everything grazing in the summertime, and that's where we skied. We just removed the power wire and everything, and then we got like three, four feet of snow, and we skied there. The schoolhouse was up in the, hill, in the hills by itself, and uh, we skied home uh, with our little bag on the backside, and uh, it was easier than walking in the deep snow with uh, boots on. They may used to make only one kind of bread, and we got a big loaf of the dark bread. We went to the baker, brought it home once a week. The horseradish, we went out in the garden, picked out the root, peeled it, washed it, peeled it, and grated it on it. Every year we bought two pigs. Like end of November, beginning of December, when it got cold, a butcher guy used to go to farmers and everything and do the butchering and uh, cured some of the meat, made sausages. We had a big chimney in the house where we put the thing into smoke. So that's how really you get the flavor then ingrained because it, every year we had the same thing. It was more like a jambon de Paris, maybe more like a ham, uh, hot smoked slowly. My mother used to make it. So I remember we had these sandwiches for Easter, even when at that time I didn't drink any beer. But the, just the horseradish and the ham together was like special for me. I don't know how many it is, uh, but I remember we didn't have that many. So it was one for me, one for my two sisters, and maybe maybe they made five. So they were very calculating. Like I remember I had one and I loved it. And then I tried to grab another one. And my grandma said, why you need another one? You already ate one. When we used to go up to ski to Colorado, I used to make them have them make me sometimes uh, after skiing. Bread, butter ham and horseradish. Every time I eat uh, my ham sandwich, I think of the snowy days in Austria. That's all for this month on Prince Street. Come back next month when we'll be talking about desire. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Prince underscore Street underscore. Hi, my name is Ray Zen, and if I could be a food, I would be baking powder because you can rise really high. My name is Dominic, and if I want, wanted to be a food, I would want to be a muffin because muffins are short and squishy. Print Street is executive produced by Charles Finch and produced by Elizabeth Robinson. The executive in charge of production is Julian Plante. Our segment producers are Rob Corso and Rose Reed. Special thanks to Matilda Holst and Megan Horrigan. My name is Archie Gray, and if I would be a food, I'd be a pea. <laughs> Hello, I'm Matthew, and if I had to be any food in the entire world, I would be pizza, because pizza's awesome. And I'm your host, Howie Kahn. See you next time. Prince Street is brought to you by Dean and DeLuca, purveyors of the finest food since 1977. With over 40 stores around the world, Dean and DeLuca curates the best ingredients for life. <laughs>